Welcome to the Iowa City Community School District School Board meeting on Tuesday, October 11th. My name is Chris Lynch and I call this meeting to order. I'd like to thank those in the audience and those on TV for taking an interest in our district business. I'd like to start tonight by introducing those at the table with me tonight. To my right is Superintendent Steve Murleys, then Directors Lori Rowland, Phil Hemingway, Brian Kersling, Tasha Deloche, Paul Rosler, Chris Liebig, and Recording Secretary Kim Colvin. The public is reminded if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in during community comments. Persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And our first item on the agenda tonight is our student representatives. Do we have West High? West? City High? <coughs> Oh, my name is Lucy Wagner and I'm the City High Student Body President. First on the list, we are very excited to have Mr. Murley coming to our Student Senate meeting tomorrow, so I hope you have a good time. We're looking forward to you coming. Second of all, the homecoming dance was this past weekend and it was a huge hit. We had a record number of tickets sold of 1,025 tickets. Our homecoming theme was swamp theme, so we're kind of hoping that that might have been the pushing factor for a lot of people to buy tickets. But um, we want to have a huge thank you to everybody else, everyone who helped out with our homecoming parade. It was very nice. A special thank you to the Corvette Club of Iowa City to let the homecoming candidates ride in their cars. They were very nice. And James McMillan and Lucy McGeehee ended up winning our king and queen. So that's very exciting. Lucy McGeehee is normally here with me. She's the vice president. Um, this year, we did this last year for the first time, but this year we are also having a Sadie Hawkins dance. It's called the Snowball. And we are hoping that this year a pro, uh, some proceeds of the ticket sales will be donated to Habitat for Humanity, which is a nonprofit organization which builds houses for those in need. This year, City High is presenting To Kill a Mockingbird. It will be on October 21st to October 23rd. On October 21st and 22nd, it will be presented at 7.30, and October 23rd, it'll be at 2 o'clock. We hope that you guys can make it, because I've heard that it's amazing, and I know that our lead role of Atticus is spectacular, so very excited for that. City High is extremely excited about um, our, our sophomore, Evan Hansen, I don't know if you guys have heard about him, but he was the student who helped uh, a student from Washington High School in Iowa cross the finish line at a JV um, cross-country meet. So today when I was talking to Mr. Bacon in the office, he actually got a call from a representative from the Ellen Show, which are they're hoping to bring Evan onto the show. So Mr. Bacon was doing a little dance, and at first he was like, oh, they called because of my great dancing, but they called for Evan. So we're very excited about that. It's been getting a lot of coverage, so he's an outstanding student. Uh, this year, our girls' cross country is ranked third in the state, and our boys' football is fourth in the state, so that's very exciting. Um, right now in our student senate, we're working on a food pantry initiative with G World and Interact Club and Student Senate, and we're also pushing for carpooling reform, uh, building the snowball, and some other initiatives that Mr. Murley will be, will be there to see tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. Very exciting. State High here and West High. Sorry, I'm a little late. Uh, my name is Michael Mignelli, and I go to West High. Uh, West tragically lost sophomore Peyton Hayes two weeks ago following a heart surgery at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, Peyton was an extremely friendly and spirited student who was always willing to talk about superheroes and his love for them. Um, he could be remembered by his students um, by the Captain America Shield backpack he always wore, uh, and he was always willing to talk to new people. He attended, to I, he attended ICCSD schools since elementary school, attending Coralville Central and Northwest Junior High before coming to West. Services for Peyton were held on September 29th at Parkview Church. The whole West High community asks you to keep the Hayes family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, as midterms in the last round of parent-teacher conferences concluded last week, the student body is staying extremely busy. Our math team just returned from Chicago um, with six finishers in the top ten. Um, and they are moving to the next round, moving towards a national competition. The varsity volleyball team will have their senior night at 7.30 against Waterloo West tonight. Uh, the orchestra will have their first concert under new conductor Mr. Welch in Argenbright Auditorium. And thanks to the successful Lights, Camera, Action technology campaign last year, it can also be live streamed online. The football team had a huge win over Kennedy last Friday and is playing Linmar away this Friday. The girls' swimming team is hosting the MBC championship uh, at CRWC this week, and the senior class recently voted for their class president and vice president. 
the maker and from a building standpoint the maker space in the upper level of our library which allows students to utilize video production equipment is up and running and the tennis court project that started earlier this year will be completed this month and last but not least students will be taking the io assessments and psat um, throughout the month of october thank you thanks michael i think if lucy talked about the assessments she would have said they're very exciting right <laughs> well thanks michael it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to imagine that it's senior night already for fall sports, so that's, that's amazing. Thanks, Lucy and Michael. Next on the agenda is ICA update, uh, Brady. Uh, President Lynch, Superintendent Murley, directors. Uh, Michael, who had to leave for another activity, was remiss in saying that he was the person elected to be the student body, or uh, the senior class president for West High, so nice congratulations to him. Uh, October 7th was a PD day, a professional development day for our district, and it's something that we'd worked uh, quite a bit on, and uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit about that. We did something in the afternoon called Ed Camp. And I think one of our uh, positions always organizationally is that if you let teachers and administrators free to really uh, you know, control their own learning, that amazing things are going to happen. And I would say that on that afternoon, you know, we definitely saw that going on. There's always things in all of our jobs that we have to do. But when we are um, you know, able to sort of set our own learning agendas, uh, it's really exciting. So what an ed camp is, is you go and, and uh, we had four sites. We had Garner Elementary, Alexander Elementary, Northwest Junior High, and Southeast Junior High. We had students, or, uh, teachers and administrators from K-12 at all four of the sites. And when you go, you basically stand up and say, you know, I'd really like to talk about this issue. And uh, we had facilitators, and you create uh, an agenda for the afternoon, and that's how the afternoon is driven. It's all participant-driven. It's very organic. Uh, I was at Northwest. We had an, an amazing roundtable discussion on race and equity. Laura Cottrell, the principal at Northwest, stood up and said, I'd love to create a safe space for us to be able to talk about race and equity issues, and she filled the library. Uh, we had a student panel that was you know, phenomenal. We did Google Classroom. Uh, we talked about how to discuss election 2016 in your classrooms. We talked about Remind, which is a program that helps you communicate with parents and ELL students and families. So a really tremendous afternoon. Uh, at Northwest, that was a facility that I was at, we had a taco truck. This has been my moment to brag. We had tacos. Don Diego was there. And uh, my wife, Jenny Saylor, and Christian Anaset and Rachel Arnone helped do silk screening of T-shirts. And so I brought sort of a T-shirt to show off. This idea all sort of came about. Um, Mitch Gross, the other uh, president of ICEA, and Amy and Matt and I sat down for lunch one day and talked through this afternoon and what we could do that would be exciting. So uh, just to say thanks to them, I brought each of them a t-shirt from, from our site. So it's really fantastic. I hope we can use that sort of as a model for future professional learning in the district. Thanks. Thanks, Brady. Thanks, Brady. Next item on the agenda is community comment. Thank you for your interest in the Iowa City Community School District and for your willingness to share your comments. You're reminded to give your name, address, and the topic you wish to speak. During community comments, person may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. Uh, all community comments shall take place now and shall be limited to four minutes per speaker. Uh, initial community comment will be limited to an hour with remaining taking place at the end of the meeting to the extent necessary. Um, to the extent you are commenting on items not on our posted agenda, the board may ask follow-up questions of speakers, but it's prohibited by Iowa Open Meeting Law from responding to questions from speakers or engaging in substantive discussion regarding non-agenda items. First up tonight is Gina Eagles. Good evening, board. Um, first, I want to let you know I read a little bit about you. I'm impressed that, uh, with all of your background, and thanks for serving. Um, my background, I have two kids in Iowa City School District, been very happy thus far. Um, one child's at West, one's at North Central. Any um, principal that knows me knows that I don't tolerate uh, my kids not behaving well. They'll scrub with janitors, they, they'll do all sorts of things, so I'm not the mom that um, my kids don't appreciate me holding them <coughs> accountable. Uh, what I do for a living, I'm a practice administrator for six pain clinics. I have a tough job keeping drugs off the street, and so addiction is very close to my heart. When I found that one of my, chil one of my children is kind of broken, uh, he himself is not maybe broken, that we don't know yet, but I took the information from his phone, took it to the Iowa City Police Department, and started the cascade of getting to the bottom of it. I will always hold my child accountable, as we should all hold our kids accountable, especially at this age, before they get to the age where I have to deal with them and addiction. 
um, took them to the police department, and here's where I need your assistance. What they told me was concerning because they said that Iowa City School District is the only school district in Johnson County that doesn't have a canine unit and does not have a resource officer. So obviously I was concerned and I inquired some more and I spoke with Officer Cook. I also took it to the principal. I went very, you know, went several levels and I see the problem. So I'm going to this level and asking for your guidance on this. Um, they told me that it's because they felt that there was a slant that they were not allowed to support the school's district with any sort of drug support because there's um, um, racial profiling, which I don't think belongs in a discussion of crime. I, I don't think that crime is a race. I don't think crime is a color. Um, my son is Native American and Swedish. For all I know, he's the biggest drug pen at West. I don't know. I don't know because I can't get to the bottom of it. I'm doing everything I can, though, to help him and go to the principal and work through all those things. Some kids rise to the higher level expectation. Some kids would like to just sneak through. And so I have one of each. I will hold him accountable, but I need to know from you guys, what is the policy with not having, why are you different than any other school district within Johnson County? Is that true, first of all? Because the police department says it's true. That's my first question. Sorry, it's a tough one. Now, due to Iowa open meetings laws, we can't an can't answer the question or have substantial discussion, but um, we can certainly reply via email or. How do I go about? Um, so just through emails. I'm, I mean, uh, I don't want to corner anybody. I just want to support you. I have meetings with physicians all the time about opioid abuse, addiction, how to keep the drugs out of the out of the school kids' hands, and how to keep them out of patients' hands. It's what I do for a living. I've been doing it for five years, so I'm very adamant about addiction and getting them corrected at a younger age. I think, a quick email to us and copy Superintendent Murley so and we can email board at iowacityschools.org, uh -huh. board at iowacityschools.org, that will reach all of us. Okay. And if you carbon copy Superintendent Murley, um, that will reach him as well. Okay. And that's where I'll get my answer so I could go from there? Perfect. Yeah, we're just prohibited from yep, okay. engaging in substance. I understand. I just need, before I, I need to know my facts before <coughs> I keep Absolutely. Pushing. All right, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Gina. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Gina. That's it for community comment tonight. Next item on the agenda is business consent agenda. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. You reviewed the bills? Yep, I reviewed the books, and uh, there's a couple of things uh, we're working on. And uh, there's, uh, of course, like, like I say, there's always items in there that we will discuss at a, at a further time, but everything looks to be in order, and all questions that were raised were answered. Great, thanks, Phil. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. I'm not getting Lori Bryan or Natasha. Uh, I'm getting a strange, kind of a strange vote. Six yeah. It just says B6. Approve only B6. I'd like to approve all of the B items. I'm going to close it. I'll try it again. Online voting is open. Yeah, Anything different? Yeah, Why don't we just do a voice vote, vote Kim? Okay. Liebig? Yes. Deloach? Yes. Hemingway? Yes. Rotland? Yes. Kersling? Yes. Lynch? Yes. Rustler? Yes. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, next time. It keeps coming up now, so there we go. <laughs> next time on the agenda, Superintendent Directive uh, 3J5 and 3J6. And um, if you've followed board work over the past spring, we had a number of sessions or meetings on weighted resource model. 
and we authorized the implementation this year and uh, we asked uh, policy and governance to review the policy and then bring it back to the board table so that's where we're at tonight so Brian do you want to take it from there yeah I just want to um, uh, you know touch base with this you know this this item we are um, we're policy and governance is bringing back uh, to, to the board for consideration to actually put into policy what we've already um, give uh, given the super authorized the superintendent to uh, to do in effect for this year. Um, the discussion about uh, weighted resource allocation goes back even a, about 18 months ago um, in February of last year, and uh, this year we're you know as you can see from the testimonials it's it's having a um, positive effect in in numerous uh, classrooms. Um, it's important to remember that the weighted resource allocation model is not one uh, silver bullet to uh, to be applied uh, and to somehow be thought of as the single factor that um, levels the playing field for all of our students. Uh, it's it's one of a three pronged approach. Uh, this is more of a short term approach to address uh, areas of, of <coughs> inequity uh, now. Um, we've talked about um, barriers to learning when it comes to boundary uh, boundary discussions that will be implemented in the next few years, and we've also uh, engaged with the uh, various municipalities that are encompassed within the the district in order to uh, assure responsible growth and um, a focus on affordable housing. So, a short term, middle term, and long term approach. Um, to improving equitable opportunity and outcomes for our students. It's great, and you mentioned, but in the board package there are testimonials, and I think uh, as we talked this in the spring, we knew that uh, it would definitely have a positive impact on the climate and culture and, and the schools impacted, and I think when you go through the testimonials, that's very clear, so I think it's exciting to be, and most of these were given to us about a month into the school year, so I think it's exciting only a month in or even three weeks at that point that uh, we're seeing some pretty dramatic differences in the learning environment, so. Probably should get a motion on the table. I've got a question. Yeah, I have a question um, too. Okay. Um, with the uh, low barriers to learning, would that include uh, gifted and talented students? And could you not have a gifted and talented student, student that has uh, high barriers to education and how do you reconcile those? Sure. Uh, first of all, we didn't use uh, gifted and talented identification as a barrier to learning, uh, but we do have uh, many students in the district who are, um, they consider themselves twice exceptional from their definitional standpoint, which means they may be identified as gifted and talented, but they may have other challenges. Uh, and so those would be incorporated in this. We look specifically at students who are eligible for English language learning, students who uh, are eligible for special education, and then uh, students with low socioeconomic status. Uh, and there are multiple indicators that are uh, used to determine that. So those are the barriers to learning uh, that we looked at in the classroom. So a gifted student would expect to be in a large class size? Not necessarily. Uh, it depends on uh, which school they're at uh, because we look at the predominance of the uh, demographic characteristics for that school uh, and not necessarily for that individual child. Uh, so when we're looking at those measurements, we're looking at them for the school in total. Uh, so we're measuring the percentage, again, of students that are eligible for English language learner programs, eligible for special education programs, and uh, within the school that uh, have a low socioeconomic designation. So we're looking at it school-wide, and then that's applied across the classrooms. Can I just follow up on that? Um, you might have to repeat that a little bit for me. but So I guess I was curious why the policy doesn't define the number that is low, the number that we consider to be average, the range, you know, are not defined in there. And and are we saying then that if we're talking about, uh, you know, a certain proportion of the students in a school who fall into these categories, are we then taking the denominator is going to be the total number of students in the school, the numerator is going to be any student who falls into any one of those three categories? Yes. And then to com we're comparing that then to the district-wide number, right? That's correct. And I guess since all along we've been kind of talking about it, 
maybe in a simplified version, just in terms of free and reduced lunch, we're not talking about the free and reduced lunch number anymore. We're talking about that number, which we'll call barriers to learning, I guess. Um, it seemed to me that the ranges that we had talked about earlier in the policy, 40, 40 to 50, over 50, were based on FRL. They are, so and different ranges. If we're going to use this number, no, we looked at uh, we looked predominantly uh, at those low socioeconomic status statistics. Uh, we didn't see significant variation uh, in the uh, special education and ELL designations for students uh, inside or outside of those uh, uh, low SES uh, buildings. One of the reminders I'd share with you is again. Uh, you know, from our work with the U.S. Department of Ag, we tend not to try to rely on the FRL number alone. Uh, so that low socioeconomic status number includes multiple uh, measures beyond that. But uh, obviously, as we talked about at that point in time, FRL is a, a big component of that. And so uh, one of the things that we found when we looked at the low socioeconomic status numbers is that they fall in several bands. Uh, and that is uh, there's a, a, a number of schools that have uh, a low socioeconomic status population that exceeds 50% of their population, uh, another smaller group that has 40 to 50% in that population, and then a large group that has uh, fewer than 40% of their students in that population. And so those were, uh, based on the conversation we had at the, uh, uh, at the board uh, work table, those were the uh, bands that we looked at when we did the differential assignment of resources. But I guess I'm thinking, so those are the numbers I have in my head, right? Those are the FRL numbers. And... Um but certainly there are special education students and English language learners who are not um, socioeconomic learner status. And so the number then, the numerator is going to be higher if we count all students who are in any one of those three categories. So we would have a higher number of schools then that would be further up on the We didn't stack them on top of each other. And maybe another way to think uh -huh. about that is obviously there are uh, students with low socioeconomic uh, status that uh, are in schools where there are very few kids. Uh, that qualify. And so therefore you find students in each one of those populations in all 20 of our elementary schools. So what we were looking for was a preponderance of those populations in schools and then those were the schools that we looked at uh, to weight the resource delivery. I guess, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm hearing you and understanding you. I just, uh, in terms of the way it's expressed in the document, it, it, I'm not sure that comes through. Well, Chris, um, am I confused? I'm having trouble matching up the chart at the bottom with the bullet points and what the relationship between them is. I guess I'm confused because you're on policy and governance, right? Excuse me? You're on the policy and governance. I, I, I am, and I don't remember reviewing this. Because it got sent, so correct me if I'm wrong from a process standpoint. It was. But, you know, we say. sent it to P&G. It did have numbers in it, and I think the committee in conversation with administration really proposed. Right. And I, think I, think it was, think I think the discussion was all the way back in May. Yeah, I think it was in May. I just don't remember seeing it in this form, and my memory is not. And one of the by one of the perfect. discussions that we had was tying 3J5 to 3J6 with the added sentence identified barriers to learning include. Um, we did the initial document that we looked at back in the spring did specify simply based on ranges for socioeconomic status, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was felt that that was too um, prescriptive. And we wanted to, since we have identified the three barriers as a, in, a, in accordance with the Department of Ed guidance, uh, to be English language learner status, socioeconomic status, and special education learner status, that we wanted all those to be incorporated in 3J6. So by tying 3J5 to 3J6, the chart, rather than saying, you know, range near the mean of just one of those barriers or lower than one of those barriers or higher than one of those barriers would just say low barriers to learning, average barriers to learning, and high barriers to learning, which will, which would allow the district administration to, um, to, to look at each building um, on a case-by-case -case basis and then decide how resources would be allocated based on the uh, makeup of that individual building. At least that's my understanding of how we're looking at this right now. Hmm. But it was a long time ago that we had the discussion in P&G since... Are we you sure it was May? Because I was just looking on the May agenda for P&G. I thought I it was see. May. Was it before that? Was it April? I'll check. Or was it or was it a work session discussion? 
I know we had the discussion because the the red the five words added to three J five. And maybe I'll just do a search for three J five, three J six. This is the fun of board docs. I think it was a work session. I think it was a work session because um, after our meeting in May, we had a change in personnel, on, um, you know, with the board, with the resignation of one of our board members, and I think that P and G went on hiatus until July or until recently. So I think it was a work session, but I can do a quick search if we'd like. So is there any issue with us sending this to the current P and G? It was a June 28th board work session, I believe. Because my only issue is just trying to use, we need to find a replacement set of barriers um, in how we talk about our kids. If we can find a little bit more strength-based language. Personally, I'd suggest both. There's nothing stopping us from approving this and moving <coughs> and if we want to make a change. We can make a change at any time. And I, well, I, I agree. Yeah. I like I like the idea of uh, more positive language. I just know that this language is in accordance with the Department of Ed. Um, but I think that I think that there's always room for improvement. And when we review it, I think that we can. I mean, I don't think it'll take a long time if it go. When is our next meeting next month? Is policy and governance next month? Yes, and I can tell you when we'll be reviewing this. I just think it's just a change of, of that word and maybe being a little bit more clear. It's November 1st, Latasha. Um, yeah, that's what I was. I was yeah. So, I mean, and then we have our meeting right after. This is like a couple second thing. I'd rather just do it right the first time and just move on than approving it and then come back and changing it. It just makes sense to just get it up to date with the current people that are currently on there, clean it up, bring it back, vote on it, and move on. Because we're generating a lot of discussion about something that should have been, you know, so moved <laughs> kind of thing. So if we feel like it needs to be taken back, if other board members would like to make suggestions about changes to this, since it's fresh, that we just go ahead and have people submit that to Brian, who's over that PNG, and then we bring it up at that meeting, and then we clean it up and bring it back to vote on it. And just FYI, just part of our routine um, policy review, superintendent directions, the, the 3J5 and J6 are actually coming up next year. So I don't disagree that if we have the wording right now, it would be less to do in the future. Mm -hmm. Or if we do it now as presented, it'll be cleaned up within 12 months. So well, I just figure we just do it potato. right and get it done. I mean, sometimes we do that whole, we're going to approve it and then we're going to go back and fix it. Let's just fix it first and be done and move on. I like that idea, and I have a few other things you could talk about if you were going to do that sort of review. I, I just figure, send it. It's going to, at some point, we have to trust our board members on that committee to get it done. What suggestions that we can take, that we clean it up, we put it in there, we bring it back to the board table, we vote, and we move on, versus keep spinning, because right now we're just going to keep spinning on this, because this word here or not being clear enough, and we want to make sure that it's clear to the public as well as the superintendent about how to proceed with this. And Steve, since you have direction from the board pre, pre, earlier this year about implementing weighted resource allocation, is there a any type of a pressing need to have it codified in policy? No, there's not. Uh, we definitely have time to, to get it done right. And uh, uh, we've been talking about opportunities opposed to barriers in recent work sessions. And so this would give us an opportunity to put some parallelism in with the language. Great. Um, yeah, my, my sense is that everybody is happy with what is happening. I don't want to speak for everybody, but it seems like there's consensus that uh, what, we, what we've seen so far from, from the directive we gave has been a good step in, in the right direction. Um, but I agree that we could take a look at that language. I'm still sort of thinking, you know, it makes, a, it makes a difference whether you're in the average barriers or the high barriers category, and I'd feel a little more comfortable if if the percentage numbers were still in there of one kind or another so that we could tell people this is why you are in this category and not in that category. Um, I guess the other thing that that I wondered about was, um, and I still kind of, I like the way we're doing it. It seems like we started with K-6. I'm a little unclear about how we're going to do this um, in the secondary level. And to me, it's not as, it's not as perfect a match there. Um, 
even if we don't have any schools in the high barriers to learning category or even in the middle category, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to somehow apply some weighted resource allocation within the schools toward the students who might need it more. Um, similarly, if, if a school is in the category where they would get additional resources under this, um, you know, we would want to make sure those resources were directed toward the students in that school who needed them as opposed to just raising, you know, lowering the class sizes of, of you know, whatever classes sort of stick their heads up. Uh, um, so the, the secondary part still seems to me to, to, to raise some questions. What I wanted to comment on is um, when we saw this policy at the work session, it had numbers attached, and the numbers were free and reduced lunch. So my own particular opinion would be that if we're going to use free and reduced lunch, then I know we can't call it that, but let's not call it something else if it's not really that. If we're going to call it English language learner special ed and socioeconomic status, then I think we need to show that we're actually using those two other pieces of it. Um, and, and then along with that, um, I felt better when it defined what was low and average and high. And I'm looking at Phil's computer because mine shut down for some reason. But, um, and I guess my thought would be even if, you know, because I know these things change over time, so I, I understand where you maybe wouldn't want to put a hard and fast number in. But one thing you could do is you could define what average is. And you could say five points below district average and five points above district average, and everybody else is high or low, um, or, or something to that effect, so that uh, this is a policy that can be sustainable without having to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody knows what low, average, and high means. Just a thought. I'd just like to be clear that we can't, you know, because FRL might have been used in a memo. We, we can't use free and reduced lunch. Um, <coughs> we can use the phrase and the, um, dis the distinction of, or we can use the, the wording socioeconomic status as um, identified in the district database. It's, it's v we have to be very careful um, in accordance with the Department of Ag. We might even look uh, go so far as to look at uh, other metrics like Title I eligibility right. and things like that as, as uh, our process. So Yeah, and I, I hear what you're saying in terms of legality, but I also think it's not quite transparent to say you're going to use these other indicators, and then when we actually look at it, all we're actually looking at is socioeconomic status, which is what we looked at this past spring. And we might look at something like Title I eligibility because it's more visible to parents and community members right. because they know those designations. And so we might select something like that that's readily uh, visible and apparent uh, to outsiders looking in and to staff members because that's something that they see and know. Well, so then you, maybe something c could be written like including but not limited. Well, I guess it does say but not limited. Um, and then you could add in mm -hmm. some of those other things. Because, again, I, I just feel like if it's... If it's if we're only going to use one category, let's only list one category. Otherwise, let's list let's let's find a way to have a metric for all the things that we have listed here. Because otherwise, we're just kidding ourselves. Well, plus, I think it's a good idea to have those other categories included in the numerator, uh, because we know from our you know annual reports that uh, there may be some some higher need there. So uh, I'd, be, I'd be fine with just sort of having. You know, all, all students who fall into one of, the, one of those three categories, you've got to find the third one somehow that makes you comfortable, but then just use that as a numerator. But then we're just going to have to adjust the ranges to account that, that all the numbers would be higher. My recommendation would be to let it go back to committee and let the committee hammer it out, let the committee do the work, and then bring it back to the board once, once that's done. And that's fine, but Brian, we're just giving our thoughts so that we can be transparent to the public so they can hear what we think. Because if we just send it to you by email, then they don't know what we're thinking. So I, we're, I just, we're just giving you our I thoughts. I understand that. And the, and the committee's job is to do the work, and then we'll bring it back. I'm not saying that people can't share it. My recommendation is in the interest of time that we send it back to committee and let the committee function in the role that it's supposed to. 
So I'm hearing consensus to send it to uh, policy and governance. If you could show that in the minutes again, that'd be great. And then so on November 1st, you'll take it up. Happy to. Any further discussion? I mean, I'll just say on the numbers, I'm okay either way. Normally I like the numbers, because I'm a numbers guy, but um, I also get that you try to describe the concept, right? So there's pros to having numbers, there's pros to keeping it a little bit flexible and having the concept clear. So I, I could go either way, but. It's easily misinterpreted if there isn't a kind of a metric in there, um, because some people could say, wait, 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 wait a second, we have a special ed room in our school that makes us high barriers. There's, all I said was there's pros and cons to either way. Yeah, it, yeah. I just am saying that I, I think it makes it clearer to the public so that we can just point to this and say, this is how we are defining you. I just, you know, it's a it's a balance between policy and, uh, you know, getting down to, like, hard and fast rules, right? So at what point is it, you know, high-level guidance versus the rules? And I look forward to P&G uh, coming back and having that discussion. I think it would be a good opportunity uh, for us to share uh, with the P&G group uh, that process for the weighted resource allocation model that we used for our uh, support staff uh, in a little bit more detail so you can see how that weighting factor works. Uh, and that certainly could help us as we go through and do some operational definitions for each of these categories and then set some ranges. Just just keep it simple, right, though? Because I think one of the challenges in some of the previous thoughts was it got very complicated yeah. and nobody understood it, <laughs> even though it was very numeric. Nobody understood the model except the person who ran the model. This is a little more straightforward. Right. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Uh, one follow-up question. So, you know, we did so much with it this year, and it sounded at the beginning of the year or maybe at the end of last year like uh, the goal was to kind of move us toward the targets, not necessarily hit the targets. But then it sounded like maybe you actually, I mean, would it look different if you would actually hit all the targets? You sure it would have because uh, we ran into some major space constraints. Uh, Alexander's a great example. Uh, we were able to enclose uh, the open spaces at the end of the hallway and add some portables on outside the building, which gave us four extra classrooms. Uh, but we actually could have used more space there. We just simply didn't have enough room. So. Uh, there were a few schools, uh, Kirkwood comes to mind, uh, where we had the space and were able to hit, hit our mark, uh, get to where we wanted to go, uh, but we struggled in others. Lucas is going through renovations and there just simply wasn't enough space even with the uh, sixplex and the tenplex out there to add additional staff. So we didn't hit our mark there. We worked as hard as we could to try to do that given the space constraints we had. So the flip side though is that if the space had been there, you would have assigned more teachers there and we would have had fewer teachers somewhere else. We might have. One of the things that we did this year, and, and uh, we were, were very fortunate, uh, especially to be a, a growing district, is we grew the pie. Uh, so we added more teachers to the elementary level. Uh, and uh, our issue then became how to distribute those. So it wasn't so much that other schools had fewer staff than they would have uh, uh, normally. It's that where we added staff was based on uh, the model. I, I think, though, that it would be helpful before we sort of incorporate it into a permanent policy just to see you know, what, what things would look like if we did strictly comply with it. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you to Matt and Amy and Steve for your work that you did. I've heard great things, as we see from the testimonials, and I've heard that as well from the teachers, and I know you've probably gotten some negative feedback too, but I hear great things about it. People are very happy, parents and teachers, principals. And that's why one way or the other we need to codify it, whatever it is. So. <coughs> All right, any further discussion? Very good. Moving on, next item on the agenda is Director Liaison Reports, and uh, as our <coughs> new practice, the reports are in the packet, and you can uh, read them if interested. Next item on operational work is the Real Estate Exchange Agreement, which I think we're going to move to the next agenda, so we're gonna skip that one. Next item on the agenda is the Certified Annual Reports. Leslie? You have the summary uh, in your in your packet. Just a couple things: uh, both revenues and expenditures uh, increased uh, six percent on the revenue side. Expenditures um, a little bit less than that, so we were able to control our expenditures uh, this year, and that shows in our unspent balance, uh, which Craig's going to get to in his report. Um, a lot of that increase, both on the revenue and expenditure side, are related to the TLC grant, which the district received for the first time of approximately $4.1 million for the 2015-16 year. Uh, so other than that, those are probably the two significant 
uh, takeaways other than whole interspecial ed deficit um, virtually unchanged from the prior year. And no action is required, so is there any questions for Leslie? I mean, thanks. The summary was very clear, and thanks for doing what we've asked to provide an executive summary versus going through all the details when we've seen it. So, the discussion on that one. Next item on the agenda is a financial health report. <clears throat> Craig? We just want to thank Leslie, Leslie on that last agenda item. He puts a lot of work into that report. I mean, it's uh, it's a real data dump uh, from our general fund into the department and compliance reporting and all that. And you're under the pressure and time pressure. And there's always edits that don't work out. And uh, he's, he hangs right in there with it. And uh, I do appreciate that very much. He's uh, uh, very conscientious in doing that. So thank you. Um, I'm here to, to share some good news tonight. And uh, this, is, uh, this is fun uh, when you can uh, talk about uh, your uh, finances and uh, uh, and know that they're improving. So I'm not going <clears> to <throat> bore you a, a whole lot with facts and figures tonight, but I want to point out a few important things. First of all, our financial condition did improve uh, in fiscal year 16. Uh, so um, uh, from me to you, thank you for your uh, continued uh, vigilance and uh, helping us to balance the budget. Uh, thank you to uh, Superintendent Murley for uh, his extraordinary support in uh, managing our budget. It, uh, it does take, it, it, it requires that you always be vigilant. Uh, every decision that's made, um, and they, they all accumulate towards the end of the year. And uh, <clears throat> yet, uh, for our financial position, uh, we uh, were uh, very successful this last year. And I'll show you a couple things that I would like to point out. First of all, this is probably uh, one of the best uh, uh, reports that I've seen in a long time. Uh, an awful lot of school districts use this report. I've, I've actually taught this financial tool for uh, 11 years now in various classes uh, with the University of Northern Iowa and other aspiring superintendents. I think I have uh, over 100 superintendents in the state that have taken my finance class. And uh, so if there's a lot of failures, I guess it's my fault. But at the same time, I think they do have uh, a pretty good grasp on how to manage uh, or how to look at their finances using this tool. And uh, <clears throat> they send me their reports. And uh, there's a lot of school districts out there that are suffering. And uh, they're undergoing a, a huge enrollment declines. They're really being pinched for financial resources. And we have a very fortunate situation where we have student growth. And uh, that shows up uh, in, on the revenue side of the equation because the finance formula is, is pupil driven. And so we were able to improve our financial condition for uh, <clears throat> several reasons. But uh, these indicators look really, really good. There's only one indicator that I want to talk to you more about, and that's the employee cost ratio, and we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But as you go down through that list, you can see that, for instance, the financial solvency ratio, which is a pretty highly touted ratio in the state, uh, we're over our target of 10% for the first time uh, in a long, long while. And so uh, that really uh, positions us well uh, for any kind of bond referendum uh, that we're going to have and I'll talk a little bit more about when we get uh, to that specific ratio. Student transportation, we continue to lower those costs, and uh, the discretionary busing is not even a part of this particular financial report, so hopefully we can continue uh, that efficiency. Just to give you an idea, this particular ratio uh, ranges across the state from about where we're at uh, we're on the very low end of cost for transportation to as high as nearly 20%. How would you like to have 20% of your general fund budget tied up in getting kids to and from school? It, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very uh, inequitable way for school districts to operate in this state. And if there's any revision in the formula that I could ever recommend to our legislators, it's you need to take a look at um, student transportation because a lot of our rural districts uh, fight uh, within 
the constraints of their general fund, they spend a tremendous percentage of their general fund just bringing their students in and uh, getting them back home again. And we don't have those kinds of issues uh, here because we're a more urban center, of course. And uh, so there's more walking schools and, and uh, uh, areas and so forth. So our percentage of our general fund is much lower. And yet we can, we can still do work and we can still be more efficient. And then our unspent balance. As you know, in your superintendent limitations, there's a, a goal for Steve that that be maintained at a 5% uh, or higher. And uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, sharing with you over the last couple of years that uh, for our situation, because of the costs that we're going to be incurring and the pressure we're going to put on the general fund in the coming years, that that really needed to look um, more healthy. Uh, just two years ago, we were at 3%. And uh, with the uh, help of the budget reductions uh, that took effect in fiscal year 15, and I know that was uh, quite an ordeal for those of you who are on the board at the time and for our, uh, for our staff and our community, it wasn't a very uh, pleasant process, but it has yielded the results that we discussed with you. And that is we were able to balance our budget and position ourselves so that we were able to improve our financial position, placing us in a, in a good place where as we open Liberty High School next year and a new Hoover Elementary, even though that's a transfer of Longfellow, there's going to be some additional costs and cost pressures applied to our general fund. So as we go through this report, I just want to hit a couple Craig, of... Craig, mm -hmm. just before you leave that, because I like the color code page, right? Simple. So we could have a robust debate that all those 2016 items are green, right? Yes. I mean, you're show the red one you're showing is actually in band, and we could debate that the higher, the mm -hmm. more money you put into staffing, the better. I just wanted to point that out. And I think the other two, you could debate the green. Now, I'm good with your color coding, right? You're being conservative. You're pointing some things out. Um, but you, you could make an argument that we're all green this year, and it's because of the, some of the dis tough decisions we've made. I just wanted to point out one thing, because I think this graph shows it the best, too. As we've taken down things like transportation costs, down about 0.8%, staffing went up a percent, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about taking money out of certain areas and putting it into staffing, and you're seeing that here with 84% of our spending going into staffing. And again, that's the red one, and I would right. tell you that's probably a badge of honor not sure why you wouldn't want 100% of your people spending in, in people, teachers, you know, et cetera. I know that's not possible, but higher the better. So, um, again, I just think, like you said, a very good year. Um, you see where the tough decisions have been made, but you've also seen where it's been reallocated back into adding teachers. So, And that's why, you know, we just talked about the resource model and some of the classroom things you're able to do, and the pie got bigger and we did add people, so we followed through with that. So, all right, I just had to do that while we had this, you know, the simple graph up there. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I just want to point out that back in 2014, when some very difficult decisions had to be made, I'm looking at the budget blueprint here, and the anticipated time frame to get back above 5% was 2019. That's correct. So um, kudos to, you know, I, it, was a, it was really not fun to make those decisions, and it was really something that I don't think anybody in our community wanted to hear but um, uh, it, it's nice to have growth, and it's, and it's nice to be ahead of the curve, especially coming into uh, a year where we're going to be very much talking about a geo bond. So great work. Good observation. Thank you. Yes, we didn't anticipate being in this uh, financial position until a couple of years from now uh, at, at, the, at most. And so... Uh, this is uh, this is really good progress, and I'm glad we're where we're at, uh, simply because of the of the financial pressures to come to bear. Let's talk a little bit about that employee cost ratio, and I'll show you why I put it in the red band. One of the reasons why uh, it's in the red band is you can see the trend has gone from 2012 at 80 percent to 2016 at 84 percent. We're spending more and more percentage of our general fund budget on people. Now, we are a people uh, uh, business, right? We're very uh, employee, uh, the, uh, that's what we do. We, uh, we use people to deliver the educational program. One of the things that we have to recognize that's behind these numbers, though, and the reason why, even though it says the band is 75 to 85, I put it in the red because of 
of a couple of reasons. First of all, the trend is going in a direction that uh, concerns me, uh, using a greater and greater amount of our general fund towards a reoccurring costs, which are personnel costs, okay? And the second reason is, is because you don't employ bus drivers. And this model uh, actually was developed uh, for a K-12 system where uh, bus drivers were a part of the employee base that went into this cost ratio. We actually use that as a purchase service. So that's outside of this cost ratio. If you were to factor in bus drivers and the cost of our transportation, we'd be at 87 to 88%. That's huge when it comes to the percentage of our budget that's being spent in personnel costs. Now, 75% of that 87% is in the form of teacher compensation, all right? So if anyone asks you, where does the money go in your school system, you can safely and honestly say that the vast majority of it is directed towards the classroom. And that's, that's exactly right. That's where we spend our money. We spend it in the classroom. But one of the things that we also have to know is that when this ratio climbs above <laughs> that upper level or that metric uh, where we believe a healthy school district should be, what's happening is that you're basically starving the rest of the operation. You're not setting us enough money aside to pay the utility costs for uh, heating and cooling our buildings. You're not providing enough supplies and equipment out of the general fund on a sustainable basis. There's a lot of other things that come out of the general fund as well. You know, purchase services for um, your audit, for legal, for paying tuition uh, for uh, students uh, to uh, go to other school districts, okay, on open enrollment. All of those things, uh, your AEA uh, flow through, all of those things are in addition to. And so if your employee cost ratio gets too high, then you're really pinching those other areas of the operation. And we do feel that. Right now, uh, we're buying almost all of our technology exclusively out of save dollars. If we didn't have save dollars, we wouldn't be buying technology because we don't have the general fund money to do that. This last year, we had to extend our curriculum review cycle by a year because we don't have the general fund resources to put towards replacement textbooks. We're starting to feel those kinds of implications for having a higher employee cost ratio. And so <clears throat> just want to make sure that you understand the implications and how it all plays out. And the reason I put it in the red band uh, is because I do believe this is an area of concern. And so, uh, and, and the vast majority of the money that makes up the employee cost ratio is tied up with our teachers. And so we just, uh, you just need to know that. You just need to know how that works. You need to know how those dynamics work, okay? I got a follow-up question on that. So mm -hmm. I'm curious how that compares with other big school districts in Iowa, and are there efficiencies when you're that big that you have some leeway there, or, you know? I do, I do compare us to uh, other UEN schools and so forth, and uh, honestly, we're the highest. And Craig, can you talk about what you attribute that to? The, excuse me? Why we're higher than the other UEN schools? We just... Um, as There's some obvious things, but I'd like to hear it from <laughs> your perspective. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, it, there's probably a lot, of, a lot of things that are factored in there. But um, urban districts attend, uh, honestly, if you look at a Des Moines or a, or a, or a Davenport... Um, what you'll see is you'll have uh, teachers that are uh, more assigned in specialty areas of support, uh, such as a Title I programming, uh, for instance, and those types of supports around the classroom where you have uh, a lot more teachers involved in those kinds of things uh, for your student body to, to support and to help uh, the student body, whereas you don't have those types of services and supports 
uh, in a more rural district or a very much smaller school district or a less urban school district. So that's one of the factors. But Craig, Pay is always a factor. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say two things. I mean, I think we've done a lot of work to be efficient in other areas. So right. we're definitely when we look at other districts too, we are more efficient in other areas. But yeah, yeah. So on pay, we we have high expectations for our people. We do. Our teachers, everybody else, and, but we also pay amongst the best. That's correct. So I mean, that'd be number one. Um, is our our pay scales above the rest? But I think that's with high, high expectations. I think that's been a good deal for us. So let's just be transparent with that and. And we've, <clears throat> we've told our association and, and others who have asked too is that, you know, um, uh, we do pay well here. And as a result, maybe our class size isn't as small as some other school districts as, because of those higher expectations and those higher, uh, and that higher pay. And so, you know, it, it all works itself through the system. And I would assume that our teachers maybe this isn't fair to assume, have higher degrees than some of the, on, on average, are, do our teachers have higher degrees than some of the other UEN? I've districts? checked into that, actually, um, and our teachers do have um, a lot of advanced degrees, but it's not uh, remarkably different than other UEN districts, where you get up to about 50% of your population with advanced degrees, and uh, we're kind of hanging right in there uh, around that mark, so. About so seniority. Actually, similar. We're really yes. not that much. Okay. So, Craig, I think this is your opportunity to rewrite the model. Craig Hansel, 2017, new model for the whole state. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for There's you. There's an opportunity there. <laughs> I'm smiling. Like yeah. That. But no, I think there is. I think there, there is. Because, uh, you know, some of these models are, are old, and perhaps they need to be revisited, too. So, Craig, one question. You uh, mentioned that we purchased uh, some of our supplies or, or goods through the save dollar. So if that penny sales tax, that's another reason for that to try and get that passed, correct? Well, under the revenue purpose uh, statement, uh, we're allowed to uh, purchase technology and technology uh, um, equipment components under that, but we're not allowed to use any of that for wages or salary. Right, and, but and if that goes people. away, then that goes away. It goes away. So that comes out of the general fund. That's correct. That's the, that's the only place you would have to go for those, right? Or you could use some PEPL dollars, uh, and PEPL dollars would be available. What well, we use that right now for a lot of building maintenance and life cycle issues that we're addressing that have, uh, that have strong needs as well. Okay, um, real quickly, just finish up here. The financial solvency ratio, what's, uh, stop it, there we go. Um, <clears throat> give everybody uh, motion sickness. We're at 11.45%. This is above 10%. And what I'm going to tell you is that when we go out for this bond a referendum, and any time that we sell bonds, we have to have a ratings from our, our financial houses, either uh, Standard & Poor's or Moody's. And what they look at is this particular ratio. And if it's at above 10%, they give you their very best blessing, okay? And if it's not, uh, then they question why it's not. And so I think with uh, these numbers where they're at, we have positioned ourselves uh, to be uh, the very best candidate to get the very best bond rating we possibly can. Now, we do have a, a AAA bond rating, which is the best in the state. There's only one school that has that. We have that. But it's also, and even though it's based on our financial condition, it's also based on the, fi the financial condition of our municipalities. And uh, because we have a university in town, they play into that, and businesses play into that as well. And so uh, as, uh, as the local economy goes, so go our bond rating, right? And so... <clears throat> We needed to position ourselves to do the very best that we could to maintain our AAA bond rating, but that's not a guarantee. But one of the things that we've done is uh, allowed our financial solvency ratio to be above the projected 10%. Uh, that's a really good position for us to be in, and uh, I thank you for uh, placing us here so that we can at least uh, have a chance of maintaining our AAA bond rating. And then finally, uh, I just want to cover our uh, <clears throat> unspent balance ratio. You can see how that's improved. And uh, 
one of the things that being at, at a little over 6% now, one of the things that that's really going to help us with is opening up Liberty. You're going to see some extreme pressure on our general fund through some inefficiencies as we open up Liberty High School. It's a big deal to open up a high school. I know I did this in Ankeny before I had an opportunity to work here in Iowa City. I understand the financial pressures that come to bear and we won't work out of the what I'll call the liberty a bump <laughs> um, in expenditures for about two or three years. It'll take us that long to um, become a little bit more efficient in how we deliver that program. If you stop and think about it, you know, we have to have all of this overhead. We have to hire probably, uh, well, what is there, Duane? about 275,000 square feet in the new building? And so we have to have a crew of uh, probably just under 10 custodians to clean that much space, right? Um, and so you, you, you hire those folks and you put them in there and you put them to work. And, but that's a cost whether you have uh, 600 kids in there or whether you have 1,200 kids in there because that's just the way it works out. The building still gets dirty with 600 kids versus 1,200 kids. Uh, you'll have a principal, you have a secretary, you have a counselor, you have a library media person, and the list goes on and on, and all of those uh, folks serve the kids that are there, and that's what it's designed to do, but there's some initial inefficiencies with opening up a building like that. So just want to make you aware that there's going to be some financial pressures come to bear. We also have to buy supplies. And we can't recover those supplies through the SBRC process, through the school budget review. And so we have to pay for those out of the general fund. You can't pay for, pay for supplies out of PEPL or SAVE. And all those supplies need to come from the general fund. And so that'll just in itself be a drain, right? And so we're, we're looking at um, some of those types of costs and just want to make sure that you're aware of, of how that's going to impact our financial position for next year. Would I be surprised to see our financial position take a dip next year? No, um, you know, but we'll, we'll have to be really vigilant on, on how we manage that over the next few years, but just kind of laying that out for you. You had a question? Or? I was just going to say, I think that's a very important point to make so that a, a year from now, or a year and a half from now when people say, well, why did this happen? Right. You know, let tonight's meeting, October 2016, stand to say that, you know, this is where it was said that we, we may see this coming up. Right. And, and, and I think that that's an important point. Uh, we can't clearly count on adequate funding. We can't, um, as, as the trend has been lately, um, we seem to be able to count on on unbridled growth, <laughs> um, but it's it, it's going to there's going to be a pinch at some point, right? It's, I mean, just going with that, it's going to be really important with the committee, and maybe we can talk about this more in the work session. But to specifically find a way to put this more in a public consumption way, so that when we have to go out and talk about the bond, that we have this kind of readily available so that we can talk about that this may change in the future. This is where we've worked really hard to get to this point, given some of these changes when we're going in for the bond, that we're clear about that. I think that's going to be important. If people see this differently around this time next year, then we should be able to pull this comparison up and right. also note that we discussed that with the opening of the school, that's how. And then we have an opening of elementary, so that's going to be some dipping as well. So just being able to be really clear with the public that we have worked really hard to get this information, I mean, these numbers where they are, but due to the need in our growing community and, you know, et cetera, I just think that's going to be important with the folks that are specifically working on that bond and for the community to understand that. Right. We still, I still get questions about the budget cuts from spring of 2014, and I think that, that a key point is, you know, a multi-year uh, uh, turnaround in our financial picture and outlook. Um, you know, that it's... Again, that wasn't a fun time, and um, it still felt. And, and I think that uh, that the outcome of that decision is is right here. And I think it's important that people understand, in an easily digestible format, as La as Latasha saying, that uh, you know, hey, this is this is res this is responsible use of of our funds and improving our you know 
picture, our financial picture, and you know, when we're the only school district in the state out of 330 something that have a AAA bond rating, that's that's pretty impressive. Well, you talked about growth. Uh, here's uh, what we've been doing the last couple of years, and uh, the numbers aren't quite in for this year yet. We're still working on those, uh, but we anticipate more growth this year. Uh, we are doing a demographers report, as you know, uh, to anticipate uh, what we're uh, planning to um, uh, receive in this district in future years. But this growth has been uh, wonderful for us in the in uh, and as long as we're able to continue to manage it with space and so forth in our facility master plan, it's wonderful to have uh, more students. The general fund cost, we continue to be efficient. Uh, we're below the state average in what we spend per pupil, and so that's very encouraging for you. If you're trying to get the best bang for your buck, uh, I think we do a pretty good job, honestly. And we show that in our tax rate where our tax rate of the top 25 school districts in the state of Iowa were a third from the bottom as far as the uh, amount that we ask from our patrons uh, were, uh, were the third uh, mo most efficient, what I would say, or, or have the low, lowest, the third lowest tax rate of those top 25 or top uh, 25 largest school districts. So, I think from a community perspective, we do an excellent job of getting value for the dollar. And uh, because we're, our cost per pupil uh, continues to be uh, below the state average, I feel very good uh, that uh, we're in that position as well. So are there questions? I'll uh, entertain any questions that you might have uh, concerning the report. And there's no action required on this particular uh, report this evening. No, Craig, thanks for keeping it simple. And as you said earlier, this is a model that's been well used across all of Iowa, and um, it really does make it easy to understand when you've got the key concepts that are you've helped simplify for us. So thank you. You're welcome. Next item on the agenda tonight is transportation update. And, Steve, I think we'd hoped Joan was here. So Steve. We did hope she was here. She's been out sick for the last couple of days, so Craig and I are going to pinch hit for her. I have, uh, she was not able to get her uh, final report completed, but I've got the draft here, so I'd like to share the highlights with you. Um, so I'm going to do my best to, to channel Joan here, and, and I'll try to answer questions as they come up. Uh, I might have to take notes and, and get those back to her and get some feedback for you. Uh, so in her uh, report, uh, I asked her to, because uh, I know this is a, a public consumption document, and so... Uh, one of the things that I asked her to do was to provide an overview of the charge of the committee, which she did, uh, and just to remind people who are listening uh, that uh, the, uh, um, the board uh, in the fall of 2015 uh, requested that a transportation committee be formed uh, and that uh, they look at district-wide transportation systems for families with socioeconomic barriers. We hadn't changed the language yet at that time, Latasha, so they were talking about barriers. Um, and the committee, which uh, was comprised of different district staff and community partners, adopted a goal, and that goal was to increase access to education for elementary students who have transportation barriers. Uh, they took quite a few actions. I won't go through all of those. Many of you, you will remember the issues we went through with a transition for, uh, uh, from discretionary busing. Uh, but in the end, uh, they identified multiple areas uh, at uh, Coralville Central Elementary School, Hills, Horn, Lucas, Mann, Twain, Van Allen, Weber, and Wickham. Uh, and a total of 478 students were identified uh, as uh, needing uh, that type of transportation, and that was provided. Uh, what they've been doing since then, uh, they have an elementary transportation committee and a second, secondary transportation committee. They both already met once this fall uh, in the elementary transportation committee. Uh, they met on September 21st. Uh, they received updates on a new bus that was added for Boston Way for Kirkwood Elementary School. Uh, they looked at uh, the busing process for Alexander Elementary School. Uh, they talked about the progress of getting students on existing routes at Lucas and Horn. Uh, they had a conversation about uh, those schools that lost discretionary busing, uh, and then they looked at other areas of need. Um, some of the things that uh, she mentioned in here, they celebrated the fact that students in Boston Way area now have transportation to school. The student family advocate there noted that they've already seen a significant difference with attendance and tardies. Uh, individual students had about 20 tardies last year. Uh, so far, they've had zero. 
Uh, so I think that is uh, an anecdotal and excellent validation of, of the suppositions that went into this work. Um, students at Horn have been able to access pay-to-ride transportation. Uh, the transportation hadn't started yet at the time that the committee met, uh, so they are going to have some follow-up uh, on that at their next meeting. They did identify some challenges. Uh, there are some small pockets of need in the Van Allen and Coralville Central attendance area, uh, and they would like to review those. Uh, they're concerned that uh, right now our uh, buses are operating very efficiently. That's a good thing. The bad thing is that doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of room uh, for pay-to-ride students on some routes. Not all routes, but some routes. Um, and then they talked about uh, what they can do to improve communication systems. Um, and that's both internally and externally. That's both with um, students and families. And then also remember that these committees have community partners on them. Uh, and so they talked about how they might uh, work to improve communication there. They did develop a, second, or a subcommittee on the Elementary Transportation Committee, uh, and they are meeting uh, biweekly to de develop a plan to address some of those concerns. Secondary Transportation Committee met on September 28th. They are uh, developing a plan to gather attendance data, which they are going to review in October. They reviewed the current discretionary busing maps, similar to what the Elementary uh, Committee did when they began their work. Uh, they have a subcommittee that's been formed to explore barriers to extracurricular activity participation. Uh, and they also uh, have a subcommittee that's joining the United Way's Out of School Initiative in order to gather some more data and, again, uh, look at ways to build better community partnerships. From a timeline standpoint, uh, again, that Elementary Transportation Committee met once. Subcommittee is meeting biweekly. Uh, the whole committee is meeting again in November, February, and May. Uh, at the secondary level, uh, they have the extracurricular subcommittee meeting in October and November, uh, and then meeting in collaboration with the United Way's uh, Out of School Initiative uh, on their timeline. Uh, and then they are looking to schedule a full transportation committee for the secondary level on October 26th to review all that data. Uh, in November, they plan to begin drafting board recommendations uh, for busing. Uh, and in December, they'd like to review the extracurricular data from the students uh, that they're gathering, uh, discuss recommendations regarding that and perhaps other strategies. Uh, and then in January, uh, to continue to refine that with a goal of bringing a proposal back to the board uh, in February and then uh, a May uh, review of implementation for 2017-18. So they've scoped this out from current to implementation. Uh, Joan said that either she or members of the committee would be more than happy to come back um, periodically uh, during that time uh, after following their meetings uh, to share any updates that you might be interested in. She said that she'd be willing to do that uh, at a regular board meeting or at a work session, whatever works best uh, for the board. Uh, but uh, from my standpoint, uh, I would tell you that uh, they are, are moving forward uh, with the directors of the board. I think they've got a, a very uh, firm understanding of what it is that the board's looking for. Um, they're also looking for opportunities, as I said, lots of work with community partners to figure out where there are uh, ways for them to expand the impact of the work that they're doing. Um, and then also uh, uh, looking backwards, uh, what's been successful, where are their challenges, and how might they improve those moving forward. So questions that I can try to answer or take back to Joan and get answers for you. Joan, I want to emphasize also the fact that uh, the subcommittee are, is uh, really going to try and focus on using student uh, feedback. And uh, they're going to purposefully try and engage uh, students in this process so yes. that they can really uh, assimilate uh, that type of feedback into any kind of a recommendation. So. Do you think having uh, the secondary student voice is, is really an important part of it? Because while that's a little bit harder to capture at the elementary level, she shared that they think that they can get some good feedback from the secondary students. Yeah. I just wanted to add in, because I was at the, the first meeting, um, just for the other directors to be aware. Um, something I was not aware of, which I went back and reviewed, and it was plainly there, and I missed it, was that there's no longer a sibling discount for the pay-to-ride program. And also, um, the committee's recommendation initially last January or whenever it was, was that we have reduced lunch students be able to ride the bus for free. And actually, they're paying about 40%, I believe. Is that about right? Um, and uh, that works out to be, I think, about $300 per child. And um, some of the student family advocates at, particularly Alexander, um, who had free busing last year, um, some of the families that are right on the edge of reduced lunch or maybe not reduced lunch and they're not, um, they're just a little bit above needing reduced lunch, 
really are struggling um, because they couldn't come up with that $1,500 if, say, they have three kids and there's no sibling discount. Um, and uh, we talked about how ESME can't be a bill collector, and uh, so it is necessary that the money has to be paid up front, um, but it is a real challenge, and some of those families have had to opt out of busing this year because they can't afford to pay that. So and that slipped by me, but I went back and looked. It was right there. I just didn't see it, the, the sibling discount and then the, the reduced fee. Yeah. I, I, you, uh, you really hit the nail on the head. I think uh, the student family advocates have uh, identified that as a, a really um, a significant pinch point for parents right now. And uh, so we need to go back and revisit that uh, for next year. Um, is it possible for us to uh, do a, um, a multiple sibling discount? Is it possible for us to uh, um, just uh, uh, waive the fee for reduced students like we do the free students and that kind of thing? And, and uh, that's part of what our subcommittee work is all about, is uh, taking a look at those kinds of things and, and uh, understanding where those pinch points are. So, yep, you're, you're right on. And those are some of the data points that they said that they're gathering and bringing back yep, for a future right. meeting, so they can take a look at that. Also, for the, um, just a, a thought about the surveying of the students, um, I'm not sure if they're gonna include any questions particularly about if these barriers were removed, then kind of questions, you know what I mean, to kind of get at, so hopefully that, I mean, these folks are pretty good at putting service together, but I'm thinking about there's this generation within uh, generating funds, uh, pockets of monies throughout, whether that's United Way or Have Life or other um, groups that are coming up with funds for students so that they can be more involved. Mm -hmm. So some of it, you know, hopefully the, out of this will come a resource guide for those families to clearly know where, I know the county has dollars sometimes, different places, different organizations can apply for these funds for kids to participate in school sports or other activities in the community, but parents may not be aware of them. So families are opting of not participating at all. So I don't know how that flows and which committee, subcommittee, but hoping that there's some kind of resource guide or something that can come out of that to help families. Yeah, I think those two go hand in hand. And I think the, the from her notes, that looks like one of the main reasons that they reached out to the United Way and that after school initiative so yeah. that they can figure out uh, where they may not have to, to duplicate efforts and, and reinvent the wheel because the United Way is already working on that. Yeah, and, um, and, and maybe I, how we can be a better partner even in getting that information out to families so that they know that it's out there. Because even in, from a social service perspective, you know, we're talking to the families that we know, but we don't have access to the entire district where a lot of that funding could be available to a lot more kids. So however we can beef up our participation in that as well could be very helpful in trying to address some of these transportation issues and getting our kids more involved. And um, I think they're actually planning on going right to the kids as opposed to surveying them. I think I used that term, but I okay. think I meant that in terms of, of the, the, it's the in-person dialogue. They're planning okay. on running focus more, groups with kids. So okay, that, groups. We're into it. Okay. Steve, a couple of questions about um, public transit. Has there been any discussion in the um, committee with uh, the city of Coralville, city of North Liberty, as they expand their public transportation to um, add routes that run by or close to the new high school, not to service necessarily students getting there, um, but more so to service the area? Um, I know that I've had some back and forth with um, the city attorney in Coralville, also looked at the Metropolitan Planning Organization of Johnson County, their passenger transportation plan, and one of their long-term goals was to extend bus routes to residential areas outside of the urbanized areas, um, which as that city of Corville grows housing out there, um, that would be outside of the urban area, but also have a building which would have 100 employees that would work there. Um, uh, another thing that they, uh, that the city of Corville has told us is basically that, or told not us, but me, and you received the, the letter as well, that, um, you know, that's that um, the time that they would be the most riders are also the time that um, school starts and uh, ends. Uh, they also talked about the route that goes from Corville to North Liberty and how they couldn't change that without Corville or North Liberty's blessing. Uh, so is there anybody in any conversation on that end as to how we can make something like that? Very work? preliminary right now. Uh, we've had, had really good luck working with the city of Iowa City because their routes are either close enough to 
uh, or when they create new routes, uh, they can do it in such a way that they serve that tripper route role, which is approved by the federal government, uh, without jeopardizing the aid that they get uh, to support public transportation. So we've been very efficient that way, and it's worked very well for us. Uh, and for our kids that live on those routes, that's a huge uh, benefit for them. Uh, our initial discussions, and I think that the letter that you're referring to is uh, in line with that, our initial discussions with uh, Coralva and North Liberty uh, have, uh, uh, they've been positively disposed to the idea of looking at that, but have talked about their transportation systems perhaps not being as mature, as extensive uh, as Iowa City, and so it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to put those routes into place uh, when they look at trying to uh, cash flow uh, the additional routes in the system. But uh, we continue to have dialogue with them about that. Uh, I would imagine it's a, uh, a when question, not an if, but how long, that I couldn't answer for you. Okay. I just would hope that maybe we continue to push, especially the city of Coralville, um, towards, the, towards having a route uh, out that way. Um, you know, service their own um, community members, their own, the people that live there, to be able to get to places they need to. Uh, and put money towards that. And I know they're looking at it. They've done some of that route analysis already. Uh, they're having a difficult time figuring out how to cash flow it right now. Uh, so we continue to work with them on that. I guess it could be F2, because the only thing I'll add is, you know, uh, access to public transportation is key to support affordable housing, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so these things become self-fulfilling prophecies. If you don't <coughs> offer the service, then it's hard to balance communities and have affordable housing. Um, so I think you're right. It's a question of if, and then what's the catalyst for the change? But... All right, Steve, I think the process sounds exactly like what we asked for, and uh, the Transportation Committee last year by far exceeded expectations. So, of course, that's what we'll expect this year. So, But it sounds like you're after a great start. Yeah, we'll definitely keep you up to speed on it as we get uh, to some of those benchmark dates following those committee meetings. If there's some uh, important information that we think we ought to get in front of the board, we'll probably reach out and let you know that we'd like to come to the board. And um, if you haven't heard from uh, Joan and the committee, uh, definitely ask, and I will work with them uh, so that we can make sure that we get them back in front of you in a timely manner. Well, I think sooner than later in the work session. Right. I mean, sure. we'll need to look at November schedule, but I think sooner the better. And, and for a work session, be my two cents. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is Appendix Nine. Dwayne. Thank you. Uh, we have six projects this evening with eight approval requests. Uh, the first one is for the Ten Plex Transitional Schoolhouse, and actually, this is a change request for two hundred forty-one thousand dollars to do the work for the six plex. Uh, that sixplex was a last-minute uh, project to accommodate the, cl the classroom needs we need at Lucas. So we asked the contractor on the tenplex to do the foundation work, plumbing work, <coughs> grading, that type of thing for the sixplex as well. We had them do it on a time and material basis, and I reviewed all the invoices, and they seemed appropriate. So that, that was a, a district request to do that. Uh, the next one is building remodels and small projects. Actually, that's uh, for a city high telecom room. That project is complete. Uh, we're asking that it be uh, deemed complete and accept the project, and we'll pay the retainage of $10,565. Uh, the next one is the main floor uh, restroom remodel at West High School. And again, that project is complete. Punch list items are completed, and we're asking that you. Uh, Deem it substantially complete and accept the project, and we'll pay the retainage of $7,950. Uh, safety and security, step eight. You know, I skipped over that. I'll come back. Uh, Weber, at Weber, we had a step eight change request for $11,011, and we did some over excavation work there and uh, some structural steel changes. And we, had, we ran into some storm sewer pipes and a field tile that we had to correct. So that was that change order was for. And at West High, uh, the tennis courts, and if you haven't been out to see them, you should go look at them. <coughs> They're looking pretty darn nice. They're getting pretty close to completion. And uh, there's a request there for the additional uh, sanitary sewer work that we did. We also uh, had to redo some of the fences that were over the top of those sewer lines. And the biggest issue there was we ran into a buried concrete slab below the asphalt that was there for the tennis courts. Had no idea. And they were probably there 50 years ago when they built the school. They built right over some existing concrete slabs. So we had to remove that. Uh, and that's part of this request. And back to safety and security. Well, I 
pump. Oh, oh, here it is. This is for work that was done at Southeast Wood and Kirkwood, and the request was for $27,933. And we, need, we need, made a number of hardware changes. We also changed the, the intercom uh, system, and we, we added some fire alarm work that wasn't in the original plan. So that I'd answer any questions you might have. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve the appendix nine items as presented. Second. For the discussion. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Right on to agenda setting. Um, just first as we get into the 25th, um, one administrative comment for November 8th. Of course, November 8th is a presidential election night and there's a lot going on that night and there's been a recommendation we do a very minimal meeting that night so we'll talk that more on the 25th but um, it would be just basically district consent and any operational stuff that had to be done. Like it might be a 10 minute meeting. Well, and, and along those lines, would there be some type of discussion about the use of our school buildings for election purposes, that type of a thing? And we've gotten some, I, I've gotten some emails from some constituents concerned about. Yeah, we could talk to any time, but. Yeah. We can share with you what buildings the county is choosing. Right. We can share with you what buildings the uh, a county is planning to use. Super. Um, uh, there, I can assure you, and in, in talking with uh, the folks, uh, so, Chris, we're not getting into the agenda item, right? So, right, you're no. just giving us some context on a. They're they're sensitive to that, and so I'll, I'll be more than happy to provide. I can provide right. you with that list. If we could just, have, yeah, if we could just have yeah. a brief presentation on that, that's all that I think would be right. necessary. We'll be moving the. Um, we added that to the next agenda. Is that what you're asking, Phil? Could do it the 25th. I think right. it, it makes yeah. more sense to do Correct. it early. Do it on the 25th, yeah. so then that way it'd be before the election and people, people would know. Know, be, be informed about it. Also, and I don't know Can where. We, um, I don't mean to interrupt, Phil, but is it possible, Steve, to roll that through on our social media? and somehow letting people know those are sites? We actually, what we've done is there's a, uh, um, a release that's out on the, under the news section right now. We've also placed that on each school that serves as a polling site so that they can see that, so that they know uh, that that's going to impact their school. Uh, so there's a the general notification to everybody that they can see on the front page, and then each of the schools that is a polling site, it's posted right at the top of their news page so they can see that. I was just wondering if we could um, pass the link from the county on our social media. Oh, the day of, the day before, so people know. We can definitely do that. Okay. Just going back to what Phil was reiterating that. Sorry, Phil, go ahead. No, that's all right. Uh, and I don't know if this is the type of a thing we, we put on a board agenda or we go to a uh, committee first, but uh, I think we need to have a discussion on a fraternization, uh, for the best words that I can come up with, a fraternization policy. Uh, somewhat what was referred to in the, the uh, Gazette, or the, I should say the Register, uh, about uh, the relationship between staff and uh, the potential for Title IX or conflicts of interest with staff in a supervisory role, having relations with, with a subordinate, that type of a thing. Uh, I, don't, uh, I talked with Botchway and uh, he was uh, telling me the district doesn't have a policy concerning that. Hmm. And uh, I think a discussion on that along with, uh, you know, something uh, including uh, sexual assaults, that type of a thing, reporting, are we making sure that we're doing all our Title IX training and that. I think that'd be a great start at a work session. Sure, Even right. before it goes to committee, I think we should frame it up. Okay, yeah. uh, a little bit more detail, but I know with uh, my discussions with Botchway, it was uh, something he wanted to bring forward to, and uh, there, you know, the, there are schools that have policies in place that we can use as models and examples in the U of I. I think we need to uh, make sure that we're informing the public and 
that we're doing our due diligence. Sounds Chris, good. Uh, I'm wondering a little bit about the lack of a work session two weeks from now. If we're not going to have a work session two weeks from now, we're not going to have a work session on election day. That kind of puts us six weeks out before we have another work session. We've got an awful lot on our plate. We can plan one for the 25th. What's that? We can plan one for the 25th. I wonder if maybe we should just to make sure we can get some stuff done. So October 25th, if we did that, um, would be transportation, if it's ready. Fraternization. You want to put uh, voting on there? Well, I put voting on the next board. Okay. The meeting, yeah. Okay. The board agenda. Yeah. Probably the bottom work session agenda now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. on the 25th. Well, I do think maybe we should just have sort of standing <laughs> items on there for yeah, bond, bond and facilities master facilities plan. Master plan. Yeah. We'll put those in every one. So the work session right now will be transport, a fraternization. We'll figure out whether that's the right title or not. Sure. Um, bond, facilities master plan. And anything left over after tonight, I guess, right? Relationships, maybe. Do we want to put the, the sexual assault stuff on there? Yeah, that's under the fraternization. We'll decide if that's two topics. Yeah, that one. might be two topics. <clears throat> we could list as two topics. And if we're doing a work session, we may not need to have an operations committee. If we'll just blend anything, is there anything we could look at operations? Was there anything that we'd want to just put on the work session? Oh no, that's sorry, that's in November. I'm, I'm jumping. Yeah, ahead. yeah, it's, yeah I'm jumping. That's, ahead. that's still the ways off. Never mind. Yeah. And I've got some things to put on there, but I think that yeah, never mind. I got it ahead of myself. Right, the real estate exchange agreement is on the yeah being moved land could, could be on the next agenda if it's ready. Okay. So on the education committee, we proposed. I think this was based on a conversation we had a while ago. Was doing the first one this year back at Kirkwood, talking the uh, update on enrollment, what's worked well, what's still an opportunity, and then talking the career technical education update. Again, we said we keep education to two or three topics, right? So that's probably enough. Anything else on agenda setting? That, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. That's Brian. Second. I think Phil was I think first. Phil was first. Brian was second. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Uh, the work session will start almost immediately right in the back of the room. Thank you.